This video is brought to you by the Deck of Many and their Big Bad Booklet series. Hello and welcome back to The Gallant Goblin. I'm Theo and today we are looking at Elemental Evil, the second set of pre-painted miniatures for Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition released by WizKids in their Icons of the Realms line. This set came out in February 2015, and despite many other sets being re-released recently, including the older Tyranny of Dragons set, this one has not gotten the same treatment. As of early 2020, even single booster boxes are hard to track down, and bricks and cases are basically sold out everywhere. We cobbled this collection together buying singles from stores and individuals from all over the world. While some of these figures appear a bit outdated and have newer models released or coming soon, this is still the only set to get some notable D&D monsters like the Salamander, Basilisk, and Troglodyte. We are hopeful that WizKids will do a reprint of this set, as they have with Tyranny and Rage of Demons, but we have no specific news at this time. In any case, let's take a closer look so you can decide if you want to grab singles of any of these figures. Or maybe you're watching this sometime in the future after a re-release. As always, you can check our video description for some timestamps if you want to jump ahead to a specific figure. We did get the Invisibles for all the minis that have one. The Invisibles are the exact same sculpts but are made of clear unpainted plastic. So you'll see those side by side for all the figures that have an Invisible variant. If you have any questions at all about these random booster sets, including what all the terms mean and how to know what to buy, we've put together a comprehensive FAQ on our website, gallantgoblin.com. There's a link in the description below. This set supports the adventure Princes of the Apocalypse. Four apocalyptic cults of elemental evil are building secret sanctuaries and outposts throughout the North, bringing terror and destruction to the Forgotten Realms. Each cult is devoted to one of the princes of elemental evil, who are godlike entities embodying air, fire, earth, and water. Each cult is led by a nihilistic prophet corrupted by power. Individually, the cults are devastating the North with unnatural disasters. Together, they could destroy the world. To prevent this union of elemental evils into one catastrophic force, heroes must expose the prophet's true agenda. The cult's agents are everywhere, and their power is immense. Let's take a look at these figures. Magmen are chaotic neutral elementals that resemble a small humanoid made of magma and rock. They must be summoned into the material plane by a conjure elementals or conjure minor elemental spell and set anything they touch ablaze. Like most things, when they die, they explode, burning everything around them. There is another sculpt of the Magmen in Monster Menagerie 3, which is more true to the concept art, but I'm partial to this one because it has transparent bits. Magmen have a challenge rating of one half and are in the basic rules. They appear in Princes of the Apocalypse, Storm King's Thunder, Out of the Abyss, Tomb of Annihilation, and the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. Most Icons of the Realm sets come with a number of generic player character or NPC minis, usually named to combine a playable race and a class. The average adventurer will not meet forest gnomes as often as the ubiquitous rock gnomes in D&D since they prefer to conceal their forest villages and remain out of sight. They usually ally with kindred spirits such as elves, good-aligned fae, and woodland creatures, making them a natural fit for the ranger class. Svarfneblin are another subrace of gnomes. Also called deep gnomes, they live underground and are rarely seen on the surface. They tend to be more suspicious than other gnomes, but are still kind and good-natured. They have superior dark vision up to 120 feet and have advantage on stealth checks to hide in rocky terrain, which are handy abilities to have as a rogue. They also have a name that's fun to say, Svarfneblin. I know you want to try it. Go ahead. See? Fun, huh? Fire snakes are neutral evil elementals. Their stat block lists them as medium-sized, but this figure has a small base. This is a problem that recurs a few times in this set. Fire snakes are the juvenile form of salamanders, and take about a year to grow into one. The salamander in this set is medium-sized instead of large, as specified in its stat block, so at least their relative scale is correct. Both have heated bodies, meaning creatures that contact them may take fire damage. Fire snakes have a challenge rating of 1 and are in the monster manual under the Salamander entry. They appear in Out of the Abyss, Tales from the Yawning Portal, and Tomb of Annihilation. 
Fire bats are from the elemental plane of fire. As far as I can tell, they are not actually in 5th edition at this time, though they exist in earlier editions and are typically neutral or evil aligned. They probably would have some sort of swoop attack. You could also use this mini as a phoenix or to represent a fire spell effect. Being a small creature, their stats would probably be akin to a magmen, putting them at a challenge rating of about one half. Pseudo dragons are tiny dragons, though this one has a small base, and there are very few minis out there with bases smaller than that. They can sting foes, poisoning them, and possibly putting them to sleep. They are sought after as familiars by spellcasters. A pseudo dragon shows up in Halister's Lab Premium set for Dungeon of the Mad Mage, but that sculpt can't really be used as an independent mini as it's on a little perch. Pseudo dragons have a challenge rating of one quarter and are in the basic rules. They appear in Tomb of Annihilation, Ghost of Saltmarsh, Lost Laboratory of Quailish, and the Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Shield Dwarves are a subrace hailing from Northern Faerun with the traits of Mountain Dwarves, getting a plus two to strength, which also happens to be a primary attribute option for fighters. Shield Dwarves may also be encountered on the battlefield as mercenaries, though scrupulous mercenaries who are lawful good. They may attack multiple times per turn, have resistance to poison, and wield a battle axe, hand axe, or heavy crossbow. They have a challenge rating of 3 and are found in Storm King's Thunder. Called a giant wolf spider in the basic rules, these are smaller and weaker than regular giant spiders. They lack a special web attack and do less damage when they bite. Both deal poison damage, which can paralyze victims if they do enough damage. All spiders can move across difficult terrain without penalty, including up walls and ceilings and through webbing. The giant wolf spider has a challenge rating of one quarter. It can be summoned via a conjure fey and conjure animal spell. Wolf spiders appear in Out of the Abyss, Tomb of Annihilation, Ghost of Saltmarsh, and Curse of Strahd. Ghouls are undead servants of the demon lord Orcus. They frequently travel in packs and hunger for dead flesh, though they do not actually need to eat. Their bite does more damage, but a slash from their claws may paralyze any creature that is not an elf or undead. Ghouls have a challenge rating of 1 and are in the basic rules. The Create Undead spell allows you to raise corpses as ghouls. Ghouls appear in Princes of the Apocalypse, Curse of Strahd, Lost Mind of Fendelver, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, Tomb of Annihilation, Tales from the Yawning Portal, Out of the Abyss, and Ghosts of Saltmarsh. Troglodytes are chaotic, evil, underdark creatures. They embody the stereotypes of a primitive monster, with their most notable characteristic being an ability to camouflage and a stench that poisons enemies in melee range. Troglodytes are elaborated upon and out of the abyss, with a new challenge rating of 3 for a chieftain that is more intelligent and spits acid. A standard troglodyte has a challenge rating of one quarter and is found in the monster manual. Troglodytes appear in Horde of the Dragon Queen, Out of the Abyss, Stranger Things, and Dungeon of the Mad Mage, which also includes a version with a higher AC. Each elemental cult has a warrior mini to represent its members, though there are no specific stat blocks called Cult Warrior. The Black Earth Cult's members live underground and pattern themselves on what they see as qualities of Earth, patience, directness, and lack of emotion. This figure is based on the art for the Black Earth Guard, which has a challenge rating of 2, and can use its connection to the Earth to avoid being moved or knocked prone. Dread Warriors are undead servants of Red Wizards of Thay, who feature primarily in Tyranny of Dragons, as well as in the Dead and Thay adventure in Tales from the Yawning Portal. You can learn more about Red Wizards in our video for the Tyranny of Dragons miniature set, which has a Red Wizard figure. Dread Warriors can be created from warriors of any race, and have a psychic link to their creator, which lets them act the same as a spellcaster's familiar. They attack twice each round with a battle axe or javelin, and have a challenge rating of 1. This figure does not strongly resemble the concept art, and could probably double for a helmed horror. The Cult of the Crushing Wave is made of those who live or work near bodies of water. Aquatic creatures obey them, so they may sick a school of guppies to chew the dead skin off your face. They have a similar philosophy to the Black Earth Cult, willing to wait out foes if need be, but they are quick to take advantage of any opportunities they see, changing their strategy as quickly as water flows into new openings. This figure seems to be based on the art for the Crushing Wave Reaver, though this figure is male as opposed to the female depicted in the source book. Reavers wield a shark-toothed longsword that deals extra damage to unarmored foes and has a challenge rating of one half. 
they appear in Princes of the Apocalypse. The cult of the howling hatred consists of those who work in secret or deal in falsehoods. They can bend predatory birds to their will and favor deception and stealth as means to achieve their goals. Their hideouts are typically in high places that can only be reached through flying in order to preserve their privacy. It's not clear what creature this mini represents, it does not match any concept art that we found, and none of the Howling Hatred stat blocks use a crossbow. It would work well for a Feathergale Knight, made up of wealthy Water Davians, with a CR of 1, or a Howling Hatred Initiate with a CR of 1 8 In contrast to Shield Dwarves, Gold Dwarves are found in eastern and southern lands, and tend to be friendlier and less suspicious of outsiders. They are considered hill dwarves with a bonus to wisdom instead of strength, but have dwarven toughness which gives them extra health. They are also renowned craftsmen. The Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide elaborates on different kinds of dwarves. Whites are vain and evil people who, fearing death, beg an evil deity or other power such as the demon lord Orcus to become undead instead. They retain their memories, but swear oaths to whatever power granted them on death and voluntarily serve them to the best of their ability. Whites drain life and can raise those they kill as zombies. They fear sunlight, however. Whites have a challenge rating of 3 and are found in the basic rules. They appear in Rise of Tiamat, Tales from the Yawning Portal, and Sleeping Dragon's Wake. The Cult of the Eternal Flame takes on the worst aspects of fire— relentlessly and mercilessly destroying everything in its path. Its members lack patience and can be extremely violent, but they also enjoy experimenting and inventing. There are many stat blocks for its cultists, from the challenge rating 2 guardian who functions as a foot soldier to the spell-casting priests and the flame wraths. But the art this figure most closely matches is the Razor Blast, humans whose hearts have been replaced by a flaming orb, and serve the cult without question, forgetting who they were before their transformation. They have a challenge rating of 5, and, of course, explode upon death. Moon Elves fall under the High Elf subrace of Elves, alongside Sun Elves. Moon Elves appear pale and blue-tinged, and have a plus one bonus to intelligence. They are prevalent throughout the Forgotten Realms, and unlike their haughty Sun Elf cousins, happily interact with and live among other races. Elf Rangers are a common archetype in D&D, both because elves gain a bonus to dexterity and because elves are perceived as being closer to nature. As a player character or NPC option, this figure is accompanied by an invisible figure in this set. Earth elementals are made of, well, earth, and can move through rock as though swimming. They can also sense the location of nearby creatures standing on earth. The stats provided in the basic rules are for a large elemental, while this figure is medium. Elemental minis can come in many sizes, but there are no unique stat blocks for different sizes like exist for dragons, for example. The Earth Elemental has a challenge rating of 5. Water elementals resemble a wave of water regardless of whether they are moving over ground or through water. A water elemental can occupy the same space as its foes, suffocating them as it grapples and slams them, causing bludgeoning damage. If it takes cold damage, it freezes, reducing its movement. Like the Earth Elemental, the Water Elemental is in the basic rules and has a challenge rating of 5. There is no stat block named Duragar Fighter in any D&D sourcebook to date, but there's no shortage of options for Duragar monster blocks. The base Duragar, a lawful evil race of dwarves who have gone insane after being enslaved by Mind Flayers, appears as a challenge rating 1 creature in the basic rules and can magically enlarge themselves or turn invisible. They live in the Underdark, and so can be found in the adventure The Forge of Fury from Tales from the Yawning Portal, as well as Out of the Abyss and Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes elaborates on the Duragar. They were made a playable subrace of dwarves in the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. So many gnolls, so little time. Gnolls in 5e are ravenous, evil, hyena-headed humanoids created by the demon Lord Yinogu. Their base stat block appears in the basic rules and has a challenge rating of one half. They can bite or attack with a longbow or spear and frequently raid villages. Volo's Guide to Monsters covers them in more detail and provides additional stat blocks. Some adventures gnolls appear in are Princes of the Apocalypse, Out of the Abyss, and Descent into Avernus. Paratons are medium-sized creatures with the body of a bird of prey and the head of a stag. 
Their favorite prey is humanoids, and they need to eat the heart of one in order to reproduce. Coincidentally, this idea was also the original pitch for The Bachelor. Except for the few hours after they devour a humanoid heart, the Periton shadow is that of a humanoid and not its own shape, leading some to believe the monsters have origins in humanoids and were transformed as part of some forgotten curse. They have a CR of 2 and are found in the Monster Manual, but they appear in the adventure Dead and Thay from Tales from the Yawning Portal with a CR 1 reduced threat stat block and in Ghosts of Salt Marsh with a monstrous CR 11 stat block. They also appear in Horde of the Dragon Queen, Princess of the Apocalypse, and the Mountain Encounters table in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Genasi are a playable race introduced in Princess of the Apocalypse and the Elemental Evil Player's Companion. They were born from the union of a mortal and a genie from one of the elemental planes, or a surge of elemental energy suffusing a mortal. In the case of the Earth Genasi, they are descended from Deus, or Earth Genies. Their physical appearance reflects some aspect of the Earth, from something as simple as always looking dirty and dusty, to looking like their skin is made of gemstones. Earth Genasis gain a bonus plus one to strength, making them good fighters. And you can also use this figure as another member of the Earth Cult. This ogre carries a battle axe despite a stat block giving it a great club for melee attacks and a javelin for ranged. Half ogres have a stat block with a battle axe, but they are smaller than full ogres. You can get a half ogre figure in the Eberron Rising from the Last War Icons of the Realm set. Ogres are a lazy giant kin about 10 feet tall who enjoy raiding to satisfy their greedy appetites. They do adhere to the ordning hierarchy of the giants, ranking below any true giant, including the hill giants. Ogres have a challenge rating of 2 in the basic rules and appear in Princes of the Apocalypse, Dungeons and Dragons vs. Rick and Morty, and the Horde of the Dragon Queen. Owl bears are vicious monstrosities with the body of a bear and the head of an owl. They are relentless hunters who fight with a ferocity that causes even more powerful creatures to steer clear of them when possible. They attack with both beak and claws, and though they are clearly magical in origin, there are arguments whether they came from a magical experiment or originated in the chaotic Feywild. Owlbears have a challenge rating of 3 and are in the basic rules. They appear in many adventures, including the Infernal War Machine Rebuild, D&D vs. Rick and Morty, Lost Minds of Fendelver, Princess of the Apocalypse, Tales from the Awning Portal, and Stranger Things. Ettons are another type of giant kin distinguished by the fact that they have two heads. The heads have distinct personalities, resulting in the Etten constantly arguing with itself. The two heads are an advantage in combat, though, and they can take turns sleeping. Ettons attack twice, once with a morning star and then with a battle axe. They have a challenge rating of 4 and are in the basic rules. Ettons appear in Rise of Tiamat, Infernal War Machine Rebuild, Dungeon of the Bad Mage, Princes of the Apocalypse, and Storm King's Thunder. Fire elementals set everything they touch on fire, and can only be slowed by water. If you look closely, you may notice a vaguely humanoid form amidst the flames. The fire elemental attacks simply by touching creatures, and also deals fire damage to creatures occupying its space or within melee range. They are in the basic rules with a challenge rating of 5. They appear in Princes of the Apocalypse, Infernal War Machine Rebuild, and Storm King's Thunder. Finally, we have the last type of elemental. Air. So scientists insist that seeing faces on things that aren't supposed to have faces is a phenomenon called pareidolia. Well, that's not the case here. This tornado monster really does have a face. The air elemental attacks by slamming foes around like they're in a cyclone. Since it's gaseous, it can also occupy the same space as a creature and move through cracks as narrow as one inch. It also has a whirlwind ability that flings target who fail the strength saving throw. Air elementals have a challenge rating of, of course, 5, and are in the basic rules. They appear in Princes of the Apocalypse. The Solar is a good-aligned angel resembling Matt Mercer and described as similarly godlike. They are one of the most powerful angels and either act as stewards for specific gods or as reserve forces for only the most dire threats. They are legendary creatures with true sight, weapons that deal radiant damage, a longbow that can instantly kill creatures under 100 hit points, and the ability to blind opponents, among other skills that give it a total challenge rating of 21. The solar stat block is in the basic rules. They are suggested as a possible celestial patron for a warlock. Since there may only be 24 solars in existence, they haven't shown up in any published adventures yet. 
Here's a weird one. Heraco Sphinx haven't appeared in D&D 5th edition as of this recording. In fact, their last appearance may have been 3rd edition. They are based on creatures from Egyptian mythology, and instead of a humanoid head, these sphinxes have a hawk head. Whereas Androsphinxes and Gynosphinxes are lawful neutral and fairly intelligent, Heraco Sphinxes are chaotic evil with a low intelligence. In 3rd edition, they had about half the challenge rating of an Andro Sphinx, so if that holds in their adaptation to 5e, that would come in at around a challenge rating of 8. Obviously, they appear in no adventures to date. And if that's not confusing enough, here's another large-sized winged catbird. Like the Heracus Sphinx, griffins also have the body of a lion, but they have an eagle head. These are fairly common monstrosities with a challenge rating of 2 who are found in the basic rules. They attack with beak and claws and have a flying speed of 80 feet. They can be tamed and ridden as mounts, as seen in Waterdeep's famous Griffin Cavalry, which has a mini in the Dragon Heist set. Griffins appear in Princes of the Apocalypse, Storm King's Thunder, Dragon Heist, and Horde of the Dragon Queen. We got an Earth Genasi earlier in this set, and here's the Air one. We don't get a Fire or Water Genasi figure in this set. If you want minis for those for 5th edition, your only options are the unpainted sculpts from the Nolzer's Marvelous Miniatures line. Air Genasis descend from gens, and a light wind always seems to be flowing around them. They gain a bonus plus 1 to dexterity, which is an important stat for a rogue, and can hold their breath indefinitely unless incapacitated. They may also cast the Levitate spell once per long rest. As with all player characters in this set, there is an ultra-rare, invisible version of the same sculpt made of clear plastic. And you can also use the figure to fill out your air cult ranks if playing Princess of the Apocalypse. This neat figure has a much clearer, translucent fire effect than the fire elemental. Myrmidons are elementals ritually bound into suits of armor. They have no memory of their previous lives and are magically compelled to serve their summoner. They all have a challenge rating of 7 and possess stats thematic to their elements, such as this fire Myrmidon illuminating the area around it, taking damage from being in water, and attacking with fire in addition to the scimitar it wields. Stat blocks for all the Myrmidons first appeared in Princes of the Apocalypse and were reprinted in the bestiary for Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes. You can get pre-painted air and water Myrmidon minis in the Rage of Demons set, but the only Earth Myrmidon mini released for 5th edition so far was the limited-run unpainted resin D&D collector series that accompanied Princes of the Apocalypse. The Salamander is the adult form of the Fire Snake, and we've already talked about this figure being smaller than specified in its stat block. These are not your friendly, real-world amphibians, but instead evil, fiery elementals with a reptilian appearance. Their bodies burn hot, so anyone who hits them with a melee attack takes fire damage, and their weapons are superheated to deal extra fire damage. They attack twice a turn with a spear and their tail. They are in the basic rules with a challenge rating of 5 and appear in Princes of the Apocalypse, Storm King's Thunder, Out of the Abyss, and Tomb of Annihilation, as well as the Underdark Encounters table and Xanathar's Guide to Everything. As of early 2020, this figure is a pain to track down, available only sporadically in stores or eBay, though hopefully a reprint will fix its scarcity. As befits their mythology, basilisks can petrify anyone who makes eye contact with them, turning their victim to stone if they fail repeated saving throws. This is how the basilisk hunts, and his victims turn back to organic matter once swallowed. In melee range, the basilisk attacks with a bite, but it has no ranged attacks other than its petrifying gaze. Basilisks have a challenge rating of 3 and are in the basic rules. They appear in Out of the Abyss and the Mountain Encounters table in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. There are not-living ones in Dungeon of the Mad Mage, and a reduced threat version in the Tales from the Awning Portal adventure, Dead and Thay. The Darken Beast is only a slightly more common sight in 5th edition than the Heracus Sphinx. It has not appeared in any source books, but was in the April 2014 version of Dead and Thay, as part of the Dreams of the Red Wizards campaign written by Mike Schley, for what was known as D&D Next at the time, the playtest for 5th edition. Dead and Thay also shows up in Tales from the Awning Portal, but that version doesn't have the Darken Beast. Anyway, Darken Beasts are monstrosities created by evil spellcasters, most commonly used in Thay, to oppress the population. They are created from normal creatures and must remain in darkness, or the magic transforming the creature may be dispelled. 
Black dragons are the most evil dragons, treasuring items that signify the collapse of once great peoples and living in swamps or ruins. Their most notable physical feature is the long horns that curve toward the front of their snout. This is a pretty unique pose with the dragon diving toward the target, but the sculpt is on the small side and uses a medium base. This would be best used as a young black dragon, which has a challenge rating of 7 in the basic rules. Black dragons appear in Rise of Tiamat. Blue dragons are popular dragon villains due to their desire to control others. They are territorial, but also like to feel superior by exerting influence over other creatures, including humanoids. They maintain a network of powerful subordinates, rewarding them with great wealth, and may use subterfuge to insert themselves into the politics of other societies, opening up many interesting plots. Again, this sculpt is on the small side and works best as a young blue dragon, which has a challenge rating of 9 in the basic rules. Blue dragons are most commonly found in the desert and along coastlines. They appear in Rise of Tiamat and Storm King's Thunder. Green dragons are similar to blue dragons in their desire to manipulate others, though the green dragon's desire is to corrupt and intimidate rather than simply control. They consider those that they have bent to their will as their greatest treasures. Green dragons mainly live in forests and have long necks and legs to help them navigate the forest floor and peer above the trees. They have a poison breath attack and are immune to poison themselves. Again, this figure would work as a young green dragon with a challenge rating of 8 in the basic rules. Green dragons appear in The Lost Minds of Fandelver, Rise of Tiamat, and D&D vs. Rick and Morty. White dragons are found in cold climates and are the smallest and most feral of the chromatic dragons. That doesn't make them less dangerous, it just means that you are less likely to be able to reason with one. They can move across icy surfaces like normal terrain and are immune to cold damage. Though they may be somewhat dumb, they have excellent memories and will stop at nothing for revenge. This figure with a large base works as either the young or adult life stages of the dragon. A young dragon has a challenge rating of 6, and an adult has a challenge rating of a 13. Both are found in the basic rules. White dragons appear in Rise of Tiamat, Storm King's Thunder, and Dragon of Ice Spire Peak. Getting into our good aligned metallic dragons, the brass dragon can also be found in deserts or anywhere hot and dry, potentially putting them in conflict with blue dragons. Brass dragons are extremely friendly and love conversation. They are only put off by creatures who refuse to engage with them. Ironically, one of their breath attacks can put creatures to sleep. The other is a fire attack. All dragons are in the basic rules, and this one could be a young brass dragon with a challenge rating of 6, or an adult with a challenge rating of 13. Brass dragons appear in Rise of Tiamat. There is also a stuffed version of a young brass dragon in Dungeon of the Mad Mage, but this flying pose probably wouldn't work too well for that. Bronze dragons live on the coast and are amphibious, able to breathe underwater. They love war and want to join armies who fight for a just cause. You can identify them via their distinctive coloration, which is a mix of yellow and green, as well as their webbed feet and ribbed crest, which make them look more aquatic than other dragons. A young bronze dragon has a challenge rating of 8, and an adult has a CR of 15, both in the basic rules. Bronze dragons appear in Rise of Tiamat, Dragon Heist, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, and Sleeping Dragon's Wake. A chimera is a winged combination of a lion, a dragon, and a goat. This large monstrosity can attack three times per turn, as each head takes an action. It bites, claws, and hits with its horns. The dragon head can also breathe fire in a 15-foot cone as a rechargeable attack. Chimeras may appear in grasslands, hills, mountains, and the Underdark. They have a challenge rating of 6 and are in the basic rules. Chimeras appear in Princess of the Apocalypse, Storm King's Thunder, and Dungeon of the Mad Mage. At the time of this recording, the most important thing to know about this set is that it's hard to find. We do our best to highlight minis and items on this channel that are relatively easy for folks to pick up, but this is an exception. If you are interested in some or all of these minis, rather than pay exorbitant prices on the aftermarket, I would recommend getting in touch with WizKids via email or your favorite social media platform and let them know that you'd like to see a reprint of Elemental Evil. Since we started this channel, Elemental Evil is the only Icons of the Realm set that hasn't come back into stock. 
That out of the way, this is a quite interesting set. Being one of the earlier Icons of the Realms releases, it certainly has some outdated features, such as those little pegs for the flying minis that are the bane of my existence, and the inclusion of invisible minis, which are pretty divisive. Uh, many of the earlier minis also had that sizing issue where the mini didn't quite match up with the creature's size in its stat block. Those issues aside, this set includes quite a few interesting and unique minis for creatures that aren't well represented on the mini market at the moment. The Darkened Beast, the Basilisk, the Solar Angel, the Ogre, Periton, the Troglodyte, and the Pseudo Dragon, just to name a few. Lots of these minis have nice translucent effects, which makes them a little more special in my book, including some of the common minis like the Magman and the Firebat. This set also does, is a good source for the smaller dragons uh, that you can use as young dragons or even wormlings, possibly. The requisite elementals are here, and uh, they look pretty good. The Chimera and the Griffin are both impressive flying creatures that are also fun to have in a campaign. I quite like the golden armor here on the Dread Warrior. I could see using that one as a good player character mini or when they're a little easier to get, grabbing a couple of them to use as royal guards, for instance. I think that golden armor just really stands out on the table. Finally, there's some good bread and butter player character minis. Um, since a lot of the modern minis are a little bit more detailed and have more impressive paint jobs, your players will most likely want to choose a newer mini to represent themselves on the battle map. But it's great to have a bag full of various dwarven, elvish, or gnomish NPCs to populate a scene in a, in a tavern or a city or other public environment. Plus, this set has an owlbear, and who doesn't want an owlbear mini? So again, contact WizKids if you'd like to see these reproduced. In my interactions with WizKids, I get the sense that they are planning to put many of these older sets back into production eventually, but I have no specific information on Elemental Evil. Let me know your thoughts on this set in the comment section down below. I want to thank our sponsor for this video, The Deck of Mini. While you can pick up many of their products on their web store, including their animated spell cards and the Humblewood campaign setting book, they release regular new content as part of their Patreon as well. Depending on what level you back at, you can vote for which new reference cards you'd like to see produced, receive new reference cards each month, and also receive their new Big Bad Booklet. This is a detailed, multi-page guide to an epic encounter with a particular big bad each month. It provides background information, art, tactics, story hooks, stat blocks, layer actions, and everything you need to run a fun one-shot adventure for your friends or drop an interesting boss encounter into your ongoing campaign. This month, as a special April Fool's bonus, the Deck of Mini is giving away a free PDF of Pork and Bean, a hobgoblin assassin, and a goblin berserker forced to be frenemies by a stroke of fate. Let this strange duo bring some chaotic comedy to your campaigns. Learn more and subscribe today at thedeckofmini.com. Time to announce our winner of last week's giveaway. Congratulations to... Nathan Brownheim. Drop us a note at thegallantgoblin at gmail.com to claim your Eberron booster box. Thanks for watching today. If you enjoyed the video, please click the little thumbs up button down below, subscribe to receive all of our videos in your feed, and leave me a comment letting me know what you think of this set. You can check out our playlist to see our reviews of all the other Icons of the Realm sets, or at least most of them at this point, and the Pathfinder Battles full sets. And check out our website at gallicgoblin.com for news, reviews, and other information from the world of role-playing miniatures. Please stay safe out there, and I'll see you next time at the Gallant Goblin.